Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we're here again, Father, and that we are um, desiring you, desiring relationship with you, desiring to know you, desiring to serve you and love you, God, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, God. Pour out your love upon us today, God, so that we would know you, Father. Know the purpose for our life. We thank you, God, for us being here, and we thank you, God, that you've brought us here. We pray, God, for a blessing upon each and every life. Strengthen their minds, God, today. My mind. By the power of the Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, there's a story of a um, guy who was, uh, he was drunk and he, he was groping around on the sidewalk one night under a lamppost. And so a guy walks by and says, what are you, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm looking for my wallet. So he's like, oh, okay. So the guy, you know, could tell the guy was a little inebriated, you know, stumbling about looking under the street light. And he says, oh, you know, he starts looking on the ground. He goes, oh, where, where'd you leave it? He goes, oh, about a, about a half block back there. The guy says, well, why aren't you looking there? He goes, well, there's no light post. <laughs> Sometimes we can be looking for the right thing in the wrong place, right? And I find like we do that a lot, is that sometimes we try to find something simply because it's maybe the easiest place to look for it, but it's not the right place to look for it. And what I'm going to share on today is um, we're going to start off with Proverbs 25.2. And Proverbs 25.2 says, this is so antithetical to our culture today and our society today, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. But it's the glory of kings to search out a matter. 25.2, Proverbs 25.2. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. But it is the glory of kings to search out a matter. So with that scripture in mind, let's look at Joseph. Turn to Genesis 45, if you can. If you have your Bibles. In our society today, we um, love to expose, right? We love to call things, you know, um, out about other people. And I find this very true that people think, a lot of Christians think that we just need to speak truth to power and we need to speak truth to people, right? And we need to expose what's going on in society, right? We need to expose injustice and shake our fist in the face of people who would oppress us. That's what we believe today. And a lot of of strands of Christianity are embracing this idea to call out everything that they see that they think is wrong with the world, that they think is wrong with other people, right? Paul actually says to one of the churches, I forget where he said it, but one of the churches, he says, if you are chewing up each other, you're going to devour one another, (laughs) right? He says, do not devour each other. Do not expose. And yet Proverbs tells us it is the glory of God to conceal it. What does it mean to conceal? It means to cover over. Actually, the word directly translated means to plug up, right? As if I I got the picture in that society of an aqueduct that sprung a hole, sprung a leak. And it is the glory of God if we were to plug that aqueduct up so people could get the running water, right? Right? Because they needed running water. They needed the water in order to survive. So it would be the glory of God to plug that up And it is the glory of God today to cover over what we see going on sometimes with each other. And I want to speak a word today to be very careful the words that we speak. Even sicknesses, and we we say sicknesses, be very careful. Words, God has given humanity the power of language, the power of the word. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. To, be, to, to bring the word of God to life. He brought his word to life. Did he not? Did the word not become flesh? 
So he brought his word to life. He didn't bring his word to death except to crucify the false words that were going on and the false accusations in the sin. To crucify the sin so that the word may once again live forever. And we need to get a glimpse of this. We did a project in Lowell on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I slept over Thursday night with the youth. Wow. Two o'clock in the morning. I'm like, gosh, if you don't go to bed, come on. Two o'clock in the morning. I got three hours of sleep on Thursday night into Friday morning. And I was like, I was just yawning all day. But, you know, for sometimes that's, that's good because sometimes we need to, um, we need to set aside our natural tendencies. And so we really rely on God. And I had to rely on God because I was really tired. But we went out that day. We ministered to people on the street. And I made a mistake. Made a big mistake. Um, when I was praying for some people on the street, they were sitting in a park, and it was me, another adult, this 25-year-old kid who just loves Jesus, really came into becoming born again in the past. His father's a uh, believer. I know his dad, and he, he's, he just came to know the Lord, this kid, and he was really excited. It was awesome that he was with us. And then another, no, there was me and him, and then my son, who's 10, and then two 12-year-olds. So they were kind of just shadowing us. Um, there was one guy, and he was saying, he's like, a lot of people say they're Christians. So this guy was saying he was a Christian, and for some reason, I kind of wasn't even focusing on him. I was focusing on this other person, and I was talking to her. And then this guy... Kind of out of the corner of my eye, he said to my son and another boy, he said, let me pray for you. And he grabbed their hands to pray for them. And we would think, oh, that's so nice. No, it's not. Not because of who he was. But we don't let anybody speak words to or, or touch in that way. Now, not, it wasn't a bad touch. He was, took his hands and that was it. He's not a crazy dude or anything like that. But we don't allow people that don't know the Lord, to pray for us. Sounds bad, I know. Sounds unnice. Well, that doesn't sound very nice. Everybody possesses a spirit. You either possess the Holy Spirit or you possess demonic spirit. There's no neutrality in God. Zero. You either possess the spirit of the living God or Jesus, Jesus, not Paul, not anybody, Jesus said... Your father is the devil. Jesus said it. And I always tell people, because they're like, I love Jesus, but I don't really like Paul. I'm like, really? Jesus, the guy who actually introduced the concept of hell? Jesus did that. You like that guy? Jesus is the one who talked about your father being the devil. Not Paul, Jesus. And people always go, oh, 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 Jesus doesn't sound very nice. So... We don't allow, and I made a mistake, and I had to then take my son and the other boy aside, and we actually prayed for them specifically. I was out of practice. That's the reason that happened, was I was out of practice. Um, I hadn't been going out as much, and my defenses were down. Because normally two years ago, a year ago, had that happened, that would have never happened. But see, we also live as people, we need to train ourselves and condition ourselves and cultivate the giftings of God in us so that we can go out. So that what we can do will have will, will bring life to other people. And also to say, when you have conviction and that strength in you, you say, no, that's not going to happen, I'm sorry. Uh-uh, not going to do it. And that's okay. But we live in a world today, in Genesis 45, where breaches need to be repaired, relationships be healed, and mouths be silenced. Joseph, obviously we understand the story. In Joseph, in Genesis 45, chapter, um, 45, verse 1, says, Then Joseph could not restrain himself. Now we understand the story. Joseph gets sold into slavery. He goes down to Egypt, right? He goes to prison, right? Because he wouldn't, go with Potiphar's wife who wanted to seduce him and 
you know, grabbed his cloak and tore it off and he gets exposed, exposed, right? So he gets exposed. He goes to prison. He starts interpreting dreams for people in prison, right? Pharaoh hears about it. Pharaoh has a dream. Joseph, the, the, the man who got restored, says, oh, two years ago there was this guy in prison and he knew how to interpret dreams. And Pharaoh says, bring him to me. So Joseph comes and he interprets the dream, but it's at the right time. It's at the right moment. So Joseph interprets the dream that Egypt's going to go through a famine. Seven years actually of abundance, where, the, where it was going to be plentiful, and then seven years of famine. And the seven years of famine was going to eat up the seven years of abundance. They were going to be, and at the end, they're going to have almost nothing. So Joseph comes up with a plan, a, a strategy, to survive this famine. In, that meantime, in the meantime, Joseph's brothers in Canaan land, right, north of Egypt, have no food. Jacob's like, why are you guys staring at each other? You're going to die. Go to Egypt. They have food. They have grain. I heard about it. So all the nations surrounding Egypt had heard about the grain in Egypt. So Joseph's brothers come to Egypt, right? So they introduce, So all of a sudden, here are these, these brothers are standing before Joseph, bowing as Joseph's dream had said, right? Bowing before Joseph. Joseph could not restrain himself any longer before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, Make everyone go out for me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Verse 2. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near me. So they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me here before you to preserve life. For these two years, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me here before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Verse 8. So now it was not you who sent me, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh, the Lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Joseph did what a king would do. He searched out the matter. It was his glory to search out a matter. He investigated before this time. He revealed himself. He investigated. He prodded his brothers. He tested them. Joseph was not simply their brother any longer, but he was the second in charge over all Egypt. And the decisions that Joseph was making affected the entire nation of people as well as other nations not mentioned. Egypt had grain, and their grain was providing life for Egypt and also life for everybody else around them. Joseph was testing his brothers, seeing, I'm not simply responsible to you anymore. I'm now responsible to Pharaoh, and I'm responsible to these nations, and it was God who sent me here. So we have to have a vision for ourselves to know that your responsibility, my responsibility is not simply to other people, but it is responsible, number one, to God, right? And also, for whatever He has positioned and and strategically placed you to do here in the earth. You're no different than Joseph. I'm no different than Joseph. That God strategically, maybe I'm not going to rule over a nation, right? But God has strategically placed me in a position where I have authority in that place. We need to really get vision for why we're here on earth. I'm not talking simply about us. So We all have vision in some sense, right, of what Jesus has done. But we need vision in order to to move in the direction that God has called us to move. And who was the one who revealed the dreams anyway to Joseph? It was God. God revealed the dreams to Joseph. And it was God who also caused the famine. And it was God who made Joseph's brothers, well, no, he didn't really make them, but 
He knew Joseph's brothers were jealous people. So what did he do? He gave Joseph these immense dreams. And you know, I've heard too many different people interpret that and say Joseph really needed to learn some humility. And I said, let's get something straight. Simply because somebody says something that God showed them and someone else gets jealous doesn't make that person the wrongdoer in that situation. Joseph just simply said what God showed him to. He was like, I had two, I had a dream. And, you know, 11 star, the sun and the moon and 11 stars bowed down to me. That was my dream. And he, and they were like, mm, you think we're gonna bow down? You know, like, shaking their fist in his face. I'm like, how is that Joseph's fault? They were jealous. So what God did was he gave Joseph dreams because he knew Joseph was gonna tell the brothers his dreams and the brothers were gonna rise up and end up selling Joseph and getting rid of him because of the jealousy that was burning in their hearts. So they sold him into slavery, right? He goes down to Egypt. But it was God. But God. But God. With vision, our lives are not random events at the whim of society, the devil, or other people. Our lives are not random events with vision. Now, without vision, the people perish. So we need vision today. Why? What are we supposed to do? Why are we here? We as Christians have our lives written on the palm of God's hand. Tell me that that's not vision that we should have. That we see, exactly, I'm written on the palm of God's hand. He has me in His hand. He has me in His will. There is purpose for my life. Joseph did not see himself, I can't find it, that he saw himself at any time, at any time, the victim of circumstances. It just doesn't say that. Now Joseph had to wrestle in prison to forgive his brothers. It doesn't say that. He seems to be a person that was always simply obedient to God. I, I'm, I'm, I, I can't find it in the story where Joseph wasn't obedient to God. Potiphar's wife wanted a little hanky panky with him, right? Like, and Joseph, Joseph was like, she said, nobody is around Joseph. He said, but God sees. Come on, if any time Joseph believed himself a victim, there's no way he would have stood. Victims always fall victim. That's what they are. Christians are not victims of anything doesn't mean we're not going to be hurt. I've heard preachers talk about no one can hurt me and no one can do anything to me. And I'm like, well, you must have a cold heart. Because people can hurt me. Because if your heart's wide open, your heart's flesh. And if somebody jabs you, you're going to feel it. That doesn't mean we don't feel it, but we do forgive. Come on. We're not, we're not, we're not robots. I think full humanity, I think the full humanity of Jesus, right? He felt the cross, did he not? It wasn't like he was on the cross smiling. He was brutally beaten and he felt every stripe for us. And we will feel the pain of, 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 of being, you know, I'm, excuse me. <laughs> I'm, I got, God has to work on my cooth, I'm sorry. But we will feel the pain of what other people can do to us sometimes. But we forgive. And Joseph forgave. It doesn't mean that those years that Joseph spent in prison, he wasn't wrestling with some stuff. I'm sure he was. Even though scripture doesn't mention it. But the years, he felt lonely. He felt isolated. Come on, he wasn't happy being in prison. He felt the sting of what his brothers did. His weeping was... His... (laughs) Cue weeping. (laughs) That was... I couldn't get a better visual aid. That was wonderful. That was wonderful. Thank you. That was good. But he wasn't a victim of his circumstances and 
And in prison, Joseph had to work out some stuff with God. He did. God isolated him. And his weeping, as I was saying, his weeping was simply the result of years of actually doing God's will. And part of the will of God was concealing. When we conceal, what we're doing is we're actually saying to God, I trust you and not my own thoughts. God has said to me, I think I preached this one other time, I said it, God has said to me, Paul, when you expose and when you open up these things, you're, number one, you're exposing your own hurt in a situation. You're hurt. And number one is you're having your reward. You're having your own reward. Does that make sense? My reward is what I just said. In the, the I'm going to really give it to you. <laughs> That's my reward. And God says to me, you have your reward. You happy? Not really. I'm, uh, now I have to apologize. You know? And I mean, we had a foot washing on Friday night with the youth. What a powerful event. And there was a woman there who came up to me and she said, I need to forgive you. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I said, for what? And she said, when I first met you like five months ago, you, we were at a meeting with all the pastors and she said, you were kind of disrespectful to the main guy who runs the whole thing. And I looked at her and I said, I know. I was ornery that day and it was me. I was upset about something and blah, blah, blah. I had my reward. And she said, and I've been judging you ever since. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to like... And she hugged me and I hugged her and I, I apologized to her. And I said, it was actually the first time you were there, right? She goes, yeah. I'm like, Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just, I was a jerk. You know, I said some things. I was hurt, Right? It was like I was trying to plan this whole thing and he was disagreeing with something that I was doing and I got upset about it and, and I had my reward, right? We've all done it. But we don't understand. See, what I just spoke about Joseph, Joseph wasn't just responsible to his brothers and I am not just responsible for the words I was talking about or this event. I was responsible for her. We say, well, you don't have responsibility for her. Of course I do. We have responsibility for each other. So I can't just speak any word I want because it's going to affect her. But now what if I had vision that, oh, here's this new woman and she's going to connect with this organization and she really wants to serve the Lord. My perspective needed to change so that I would start thinking outside of myself and what I want, right? And think more like Joseph. In the sense that he knew, right, his responsibility was greater than simply his brothers. Joseph had to walk through these difficult circumstances as we do, as I do, as all of us do. So that he would have the ability to forgive. And we serve such a kind and loving God. God knew it was going to be difficult for everyone involved in this situation in the Joseph story in Genesis. He knew it was going to be difficult for Joseph. He was going to be lonely, isolated, as I said. How about Jacob? <laughs> Did God not love Jacob? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Pretty big guy, <laughs> right? And Jacob became Israel. Israel became Christ. Like, huge. But yet, Joseph, Jacob loved Joseph Right? It says more than all of his other children, which probably causes his other kids to be a little mad at him anyway. Right? Instead of going to the source, like, Jacob, why do you love Joseph more than the rest of us? They turned and they said, actually, let's just go at Jake, Joseph. What did jo Joseph didn't deserve that. So what? He didn't cause his dad to love him more. His dad simply did. So, instead of going to the source, like we do, we never go to the source, right? We just transfer our own feelings onto other people. <laughs> go to the source the source is not also the person that we originally heard us or something like that the source is God go to God 
And bring it to God. Cast your cares upon the Lord, for He cares for you. But it was difficult for Jacob and for the brothers. Come on. Then not, first of all, not all of them wanted to do it. So this was causing conflict, right? Reuben, the oldest, tried to protect Joseph and say, no, don't do this. How about Judah? We forget who Judah was. <laughs> Judah, the, the direct lineage to Jesus. Judah was one of the brothers. But yet we live, we serve a redeeming God, huh? Do we not? Thank God that he didn't cut off Judah. <laughs> But when we encounter the living God, we enter into the Spirit, or rather the Spirit enters us. And we have the divine power to forgive. And forgiveness is not simply a command without like uh, what I like to call a manual. The manual of how to forgive is the cross of Jesus Christ. Bring it to the cross and you will receive divine power to forgive. The command is never without the ability to do it. If you read the Gospels, if you read the Gospels, you see all of these people failing. All the disciples, they couldn't do what Jesus was asking them to do. Do we see that? We agree on that? That the disciples actually before the cross couldn't do what Jesus was asking them to do. That's why they all fled. That's why they all failed. That's why Peter denied him, right? But please tell me you can read the rest of the New Testament, the book of Acts and on, as something happened to them, right? Like, did we see something radically change in them? Where Peter was like, don't crucify me like him, flip me upside down. Something happened. That all the words of Jesus were now taken into the cross and crucified. The flesh was crucified. The thing that made them fail was destroyed in the cross. And Jesus buried it and rose in victory over it and gave us brand new life. It's not a transaction as much as it is a vicarious taking onto himself our sinful nature, right? And then in return us receiving by the power of the Spirit brand new life. Transaction is like Jesus died for me equals I have new life. Like it's a, we think about it. But actually my sinful humanity is literally sucked out of me onto the cross. So I don't even have it anymore. And therefore the new resurrection power of God raised him from the dead and now I, I have brand new life. That's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. Is that that brand new baptism life comes in me and the life of Jesus Christ enters me and it affects everything, it changes my mind. Right? Kevin, right at the cellular level, right? <laughs> I mean, it gets in my DNA. What if, right, Kevin and I talked about this, was what if every cell in my DNA of every cell in the nucleus, right, has the image of Christ? Possible? What if every cell starts to obey him? Oh, I gotta try not to sin! <laughs> right? Like, oh, I just gotta try, I just can't do it. You're like, well, maybe... Maybe you need a little spirit. Because God gives us power. And God, what God does is also He changes our desires. Like, I don't even think about desires I used to have. Our life dies at the cross. The sinful nature is crucified. We receive the life of Jesus directly into our spirits. Igniting our hearts to forgive. He doesn't leave us orphans. An orphan would be somebody who is left alone and has no power to do anything. He doesn't leave us like that. He gives us power to forgive. When he says, I command you to love, I can't love. Well, no, you can't love without the power of the Spirit. I can't evangelize out on the street. I can't talk to people without the power of the Holy Spirit working in my heart. Why? Because I don't love them enough to do it. Like, you have to love somebody enough to want to do that. And I don't love people enough without God loving me. Like, people always say, they talk to me about different religions, and I said, your religion's too hard for me. It's too much work. It's too difficult. I don't want to go 
pray facing east seven times a day. I can't do it. I'm like, doesn't that create you failure anyway when you don't do it? And then you fail and you feel like a failure and you feel like I didn't do this right and what a weight to live under, right? Joseph had incredible vision. For God sent me here. His eyes were on God. And when we see the majesty and glory of God, we can cover over anything. We can be repairers of the breach. All the years in pain, of pain, of loneliness, of simple, simply missing his relationships with his brothers, with his father, all the years that the locusts have eaten in his life were now being restored. The breach was repaired and Joseph wept. It was as if the whole world that Joseph had lived with upon his shoulders was now being released in his tears. And he just cried. He couldn't contain himself. He couldn't contain himself because he understood what God had done, but it was years that this all this process had taken place. And Joseph had been concealing and covering over and holding it in. But when the time was right, it released. And it says he wept. And once he released it, what did Joseph do? He called his brothers to him. And I picture this as the most kind and compassionate moment of Joseph's life where he looked at his brothers and in the most faithful, trusting way, he said, I am Joseph, your brother. And those words spoke to his brothers and said, don't worry. I'm not going to let anybody know. Right? Like, it was just this moment where he said, trust me. And his brothers were like, oh. I mean, it doesn't say it in the Bible, but I'm bet they were like, in their eyes, they were like, we're so sorry. We're so sorry. And there was this repair of the breach, this repair of lost relationships. God wants to restore relationships with us, with other people. And I don't know if me speaking about this is stirring anything up with maybe broken relationships in your life. But God is asking us to cover people. It says that love covers a multitude of sins. To not expose somebody else, not expose what they're going through, but cover them over because the reality of life is spiritual, not simply natural. So when we cover over something, God sees it and then God moves into that space. When we allow the Lord, instead of us speaking the words and having our reward, we hold our peace, right? It almost used to be normal for people to say, just hold your peace. <laughs> right? I mean, that was just a normal way of thinking. That, But we don't live like that anymore. I think technology messes with our minds too by giving us an overflow of words. But hold our peace creates space for the Lord to move into that area. And Joseph wept. But the last part, before I close, <clears throat> when he says, I am Joseph, your brother, he doesn't say, I am Joseph, commander and second in charge of Egypt. Did you know I was going to say that, Ma? She's like shaking her head before I said it. I am Joseph, Right? He doesn't say, I am Joseph, Pharaoh's right-hand man. He says, I am Joseph, your brother. He identifies with them. 
But the second part of the statement, he wants to make sure that they understand. And he was specific. I am Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. In case you were questioning, you didn't have another brother, did you? <laughs> right? The one you sold into Egypt, remember me? You remember that, guys, right? Yeah, we remember. Two things, though, about concealing something. I do want to say this. I want to give a little um, P.S. about that. In order for us to conceal a matter in reference to God, we must know that God desires the matter to be concealed. And we also must know that God is doing something bigger than what we see. This doesn't justify an actual offense that needs to be spoken about, right? That there's definitely issues. Like, <clears throat> in churches, there have been obviously issues that have happened where people said, well, let's just keep it in the church, right? And allowing the person who committed the offense to continue to do it again and again. That's not what God means, you understand the difference, right? Everybody, I just wanted to make sure that we're not saying conceal things, <laughs> right? And act like it doesn't exist and it's not going on. That's not what God is saying. Because there's abuse that happens that needs to get called out so the person can get healed. The second part, but a king, the glory of a king is to search out a matter. Well, Jesus was a king. And there was a second part of the, 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 the sermon that I was going to share, but I've gone a little long and I don't want to keep you that long. But I'm going to say Jesus sought out matters. And the second part was the woman at the well. And when Jesus seeks out that, he starts probing. The second part of Proverbs 25 too is, but a king, the glory of a king is to search out a matter. Well, you are all princes and kings and priests. And I am. So we can search out a matter to bring it to God, to find out what God wants to do with it. If he wants to conceal it or he wants that matter to be, right, exposed. If he wants that matter to come to light. If he wants that the truth to shine on it. So when Jesus is talking to her out of the well and, she, and he says to her, um, well, go call you. He's talking about living water. And it's funny because she's digging in a well and he talks about a fountain. And she's thinking in her mind like, He's probing. Again, like Joseph was probing his brothers, testing. Jesus is testing the woman to see where her heart is. Do you really want this? And she always asks the right question. She's always like, I want that living water. And Jesus is like, oh, you're on the right path. But Jesus is probing. He's testing. He's pushing. He just doesn't come out and say things. He, he sees like, do you want it? And she wanted it. She wanted this living water. And she's digging in this fountain and driving a drop and Jesus is talking about living water, you'll never thirst again. You won't have to keep drawing water from the fountain. Fount, uh, or water from the well. You're, digging, you're going into this well and I'm going to give you a fountain that's just going to bubble up through the earth. Both what she was doing required constant and continuous work. The two phrases Jesus uses is that you're going to receive something, both of them. Living water, never going to thirst again. Bubbling up. Never going to stop springing up. You won't have to dig deep into this well. And the second part was when she says, well, give me this living water. Jesus says, go call your husband. And she says, oh, I have no husband. And Jesus said, yeah, you're right. You've had five husbands and the one you have with now is not your husband. Now, she wasn't just a five-time divorcee, as we think. It was that either her, maybe her husband's died or... Um, in that type of society, as a Samaritan woman, she wasn't free to divorce. She wasn't just like living loose on the on the, on the land. Like she was um, probably a woman who had been very op oppressed in her life. But yet, she's still trying to hide something. She's still trying to conceal something. And does Jesus just allow her to conceal it? He doesn't. He searches out a matter because he's a king. And it is his glory to search out the matter. So he searches it out. But where were his disciples at the time? Away, buying food. So it's him and her. He, he searches it out to heal it. To bring it to light. So that it would be healed. And we have to understand that then Jesus decided he was going to conceal it from his disciples. 
He wasn't going to expose her to his disciples or anybody else because her heart starts bubbling up with that living water that he was talking about. And she just runs off and she starts telling everybody, the Messiah, I found the Messiah. He told me, and he doesn't, like the funny part about the story is is she says, he told me everything about my life. (laughs) So, I mean, that's just a great, like, he only said, you had five husbands and the one you live with now is not your husband. You know everything about me. (laughs) Like, it's funny to me. Like, he just, it was like, almost like when he meets Nathaniel, right? And he says, oh yeah, Nathaniel, you know, before they called you, I saw you sitting under the tree. You're the Messiah! (laughs) He's like, you believe I'm the Messiah because I said you, I saw you sitting under the tree? Yes, yes. No, that's all it took. <laughs> right? I mean, I love that. That's living water. You get so excited that just one thing, you're like, you run with it. I mean, I, you know, like when you meet a new Christian, like God shows them, remember Jay, my best friend, when we came to know Christ, when we were 19 years old, he would call Revelation downloads. And he would be, he would put his remember he'd be like oh oh he was like oh, geez oh it was so amazing like we'd be like Jay what's wrong with you he just because oh. he was so excited that he was dead and now he's alive there should be some excitement in that right that that our spirits were dead and it only takes just a teeny bit of spirit. To revive us in that little bit of spirit, we go, you know, we start doing a song and dance. Amen.